Uh, he's going he's to kill me uh, because he told you to turn off your cell phones. I'd, I'd like you to actually get your cell phones on, on right now. Get them out. Uh, and what I'd like, I, I'll ask you to do is I'm going to give you my phone number, my cell phone number. And uh, I would like you, during the reading, um, I'm going to be doing a lot of different things, uh, you know, and you may get bored with one of them or whatever, uh, and, and, you know, just text my cell phone, uh, you know, let me know how I'm doing, you know, the sort of reaction. Uh, I, uh, so here's the number, you got it, you ready? Um, 205-310-2932. All right, I, uh, okay, so I, I started this when I was at uh, Penn State Altoona, I only work the big venues. Um, and, uh, and at Penn State Altoona, they were doing something where they, um, you know, where they uh, uh, had students, uh, undergraduates, who were um, required to be there, poor kids. And, uh, and, and also, they're freshmen, you know, so they don't think that you can actually see them out there. And so I looked up while I was reading, and they were all... <laughs> and so I stopped the reading, and I said, I said, are you texting? And they went, because they were freshmen, yeah. And I, and I said, uh, who are you texting? And they pointed at each other in the room. And I said, I want in on that action, you know? So, so here's the number again, 205-310-2932. Okay, so have fun. If I were really good, if I were like the freshman, I'd be able to do this reading and actually be texting back to you. Um, but I'm not that good yet. So, so thanks for playing along with that. Um, I'm going to read a variety of things, as I said, from a variety of stuff, and they're pretty short things. And so if I start one and you don't like it, you know, go ahead and text. Text somebody else, I don't care. Uh, and then, you know, then I'll move on to something else. I'm going to start with uh, something from Michael Bartone, and I was telling my class here, I really like titles that uh, are names. You know, Jane Eyre, uh, Huckleberry Finn, um, uh, David Copperfield, Michael Bartone. Uh, and, uh, and what they are, are there are 50 contributors notes, and many writers in the audience, you know what a contributors note is, it's a thing at the back of the book uh, that usually says, you know, Michael Martone was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, he's published this, he's, he teaches here. And so instead, I, I it changed them a little bit. And I would send them off to uh, magazines, and if they took them, um, I would ask the editor to actually publish them in the back of the book in the contributors notes. So a lot of these things, they're not in table of contents. They're just in the contributor's notes section of the magazine. So, um, so that was the sort of project here. And it's great. I, I'm terrible with titles. Every, everyone is titled contributor's note. Michael Martone was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and was educated in the public schools there. His first published work, a poem, Recharging Time, and a character sketch, Tim the Experience, about his brother, appeared in the Forum an annual literary magazine produced by the school system featuring contributions of its student. His mother, a high school freshman English teacher at the time, in fact wrote the poem in the character sketch, signing her son's name to the work and sending it to the editor, another English teacher at the Southside Junior High School who had been a sorority sister, Cap Alpha Theta, in college. Indeed, most of his papers written for school were written by his mother. Examples included English research papers, history term papers, translations from the Latin, speeches, and lab reports. It began, innocently enough, with his mother writing his essays, the prose supposedly dictated by the son to his mother, whose penmanship was far and away more legible. This arrangement, her son sitting across the kitchen table, in a sense thinking out loud as she transcribed his thoughts with the same pen she used to grade her own students' papers, engendered in her a very active editorial intervention, which began to shape the spontaneous utterances emanating from her son. Soon the situation evolved to the point where her son sat silently while she wrote an original, she wrote an original response to his initial prompt. Once she finished the first draft, she read it back to her son, who made a few minor suggestions as to form, style, and content. It was at this time and under these conditions that Martone began thinking of himself as a writer, his mother promoted that view in other ways, announcing to her friends at the local chapter of the Educational Honorary that her son had an aptitude for writing. The collaboration continued through college where assignments were mailed home or returned, or in some extreme cases, the prose response was communicated via the telephone and copied out in a rather cramped and illegible longhand in the dormitory phone booth. 
Most of Martone's first book of stories and his occasional essays on the subject of writing, published under his own name, uh, were written by his mother, who learned finally to type in 1979, the year she wrote his graduate thesis. <laughs> Today, Martone receives micro-cassette recordings that his mother has made of his future work, with the hard copy arriving by fax or courier with little or no inter interaction between the collaborators prior to the work's appearance. Martone is hard-pressed to tell you what exactly of his published work could truly be said to be his original contribution, if any, including this contributor's note and the contribution published somewhere else in this magazine. So, go on down. You look uncomfortable. I mean, there are seats up here. Um, so there are 50 of those con uh, contributor's notes, uh, and it's great. Sometimes I would send it off to a magazine. Get into the spit row right here. Um, uh, I'd send them off to magazines, and uh, the editor would say, no, no, I'm going to publish it in the front part of the book. And, uh, and, I'd, and he, then he'd say, you know, send me, send me another contributor's note. So I'd send another contributor's note. And he'd write back and say, no, no, send a real contributor's note. And I said, well, these are real contributors. Um, any of you, I, I hear at Cleveland State, you're, you know, you're fashion forward, you're looking forward. Um, so they don't, they don't interfere with any of your internet's business, right? So many of you know a little magazine on the internet called uh, Nerve.com. Yeah, we know. Uh, anybody remember what the uh, the subtitle of Nerve.com is? Literary smut. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, for those of you who haven't gone, you'll be sure to go. You know, literary smut. Yeah. This is really good. Um, uh, uh, I got a, an email from the editor there. Honest to God, her name is Susan Dominus. <laughs> and uh, Susan wanted me to do this, and, and really, kids, try this at home. Uh, there's a section there called objectification, and what you have to do, it's a great little exercise, you have to take an object from the world um, and eroticize it, make it sexy. Two rules. One is you can't use stuff that's already been eroticized. Whips, chains, leather, that's already out. The other one was you can't use something that is personally erotic. I didn't know how she'd know that. <laughs> but I played along. With, you know, I played along with. Her. So I, he, he, what I'm going to read to you is actually something that they rejected. Not sexy enough. I know. I mean, uh, but but uh, so I thought about it for a while, and so I came up with, and I well, I got to see. I came up with the thermostat. Is that the thermostat here? Maybe, I don't know. Somewhere in this room, you know what the thermostat is, those little boxes and the various things that regulate heat and, and air conditioning. So here's the thing, i got to make the thermostat sexy. <laughs> thermostat. I touch it every day, a secular mezuzah at the threshold of climactic change. <laughs> On the wall at eye level, a floor above the furnace it regulates, it is connected and remote. A hemispheric sconce embossed with a proprietary brand on its clear plastic bubble. Honeywell. <laughs> with the tread of my fingertip, I nudge the clear cleats of the inner ring delicately, dialing a safe toward the triggering calibration of the two fine red needles, one below indicating its shadow falling upon a numbered scale, how it feels, and the other on top quivering as it inches toward the desired state. <laughs> I think I'm hooked. I really, I'm hooked now. Here's where I blow it. It's just, it's, Henry Dreyfus designed it. <laughs> what was I thinking? Just another mechanical object in the stream of streamlining, modern to imagine everything smooth, rounded, shaped by constant manipulation, the wearing away, friction as artist, all this metal in your hands, pliant, malleable, plastic even, warm to the touch to the point of melting, molded into these organic solids of French curves so that even the most inanimate of things looked, when not moving, to move. Everything designed for speed, molting, molecule by molecule, thin peelings of skin, a response to the constant abrasion of invisibly moving air, the rubbing away, the erasure to the point of sculpted cupped parentheses, perfectly still, but still in motion. Thermostat, heat of course, but in stat cleaves both the sense of the immediate, the stat of televised cold blues, 
and the stat of passive regulation, stationary, statistics, standstill, the instrument for feedback as is skin, a touch, a response to touch, the shiver, the twitch, the goose flesh, the blush. Mine is anodized beneath the cowling, the mechanism of static, the watch spring and the bulb of quaking quicksilver that trembles on its mirrored surface, responding to the eddies of my breath, and when I stop breathing, to the re reverb of my heart transmitted through the cold, cold air. I touch it, and touching it, I ease the imagined temperature past the ambient one. At that moment, deep in the house, I feel that sound like the distant launching of mortars, the inhalation of air as the oxygen in the room around me is drawn down, the returns, the jets of blue flame igniting somewhere. So I sent that off to Susan, <laughs> and uh, Susan, Susan wrote back, and she said, Michael, she said, you think you're being pretty explicit, don't you? And I said, well, I guess I'm not back. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, really, our readers can take a little bit more. So if you want to see the edited version of Thermostat, it's online. <laughs> okay, yeah, so. uh, it's great. I, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm in Alabama, and here I am, uh, you know, up here. It's so... And I grew up in, of course, in Fort Wayne, so I miss the cold. And I'm, my thermostat is completely reset. My, you know, internal thermostat. So anyway, come on. You, you, there's, 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 there's two right there, right? Here, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I did another book. It's called the Blue Guide. Uh, the Blue Guide to Indiana. Um, it's a travel guide. Um, and I was telling my students, I'm not very good with characters or plot. Uh, so I needed a, I needed a, a fiction book uh, that has no characters and no plot, so I came up with a travel guide. No characters, no plot. So, so you know what these travel guides are, right? I mean, they, it's just various things, places to do, some tours and things. And of course, the underlying joke of the book is, nobody tours in Indiana. <laughs> Not even people in Indiana tour Indiana. Uh, and so, uh, again, as with the contributor's notes, when I published these things, I did not send them out to um, uh, literary magazines. Uh, uh, literary magazines. I sent them to newspapers in Indiana. And uh, when they accepted them, if they accepted them, I also negotiated with the editor and said, could you publish these without any enabling device? You know, not saying these are made. Just that these are possible things to do on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so we had fun. Uh, so there are various tours. There's the sex tour of Indiana, of course. <laughs> There's uh, famous garbage and waste disposal sites. Uh, there is the death tour. Um, uh, what else is there? There's also a little cookbook in there where you can actually make pork cake. Uh, it works. I, I, I made the pork cake. Uh, it works. Uh, and what I'm going to do is read the entire art tour. And, the, and in all the other tours, there are five or six things to do. There's like wars and skirmishes. There have been two wars in Indiana fought over time. Uh, and, and if you know that Indiana doesn't, doesn't or used to not change their time. But uh, this is the art tour. Um, you know, it only has one thing. Okay, so you kids, you kids out there, I know you love your PBS. <laughs> you know, you like to watch that PBS. What's the show you like to watch on PBS? Reading Rainbow. Reading Rainbow, great show. <laughs> it's a wonderful show. A lot of people like it, but that's not really. Nova Science Now. Nova Science Now, excellent. You have the whole CD or DVD collection. It's, just, uh, it's true, but that's not it. What else? Magic Theater. Mm. Very good. I mean, you, and you, you know, with wine and stuff, you know, just, just very true. And Matt, very good. That PBS, I tell you, the kids love it. What else? Sesame Street. Sesame Street, Sesame Street. yes. Antiques Rojo, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but no. Mr. What? No, that is <laughs> always, always the excitement of the improvisation and the great people they get in and answer the phones. No, no, no. The, the one you like, the one you like, it, 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 you know it. It's Barney. The, Mr. No, Barney, yes. Mr. It, Rogers. Mr. Rogers, of course, but no, there's still one even more great. It's a guy. And he sits in a studio. Oh, yeah. He has an afro. Oh, Bob Ross. Bob Ross. Yes, the kids love 
love it. Now, do all of you know Bob Ross? Yes, you know. But he, he has this huge afro. He, it's a painting show, and he paints the same picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know this guy. He's, oh, yeah. You love it, don't you? I wonder why the kids love him so. <laughs> so, so understated, so mellow. <laughs> He's from Indiana. <laughs> um, and so, okay, so the tour, this was the art tour in the Blue Guide to Indiana, and this is uh, the Musée de Bob Ross uh, in Muncie, Indiana. Now, you know about Muncie, it's where Ball State is. Ball State got its money from the Ball Brothers, who invented the ball jar. Um, so it's a, it, they got their fortune from canning. Uh, and uh, it's also where David Letterman went to school. And, you know, there's still a David Letterman scholarship at Ball State. You have to maintain a C or lower average. <laughs> I did not make that up. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is the, Muse the Musée de Bob Ross. I love saying that. Uh, in Muncie, Indiana, the, from the Blue Guy to Indiana. Housed in the converted and renovated Ball Brothers department store in downtown Muncie, the Musée de Bob Ross is home to the world's largest collection of works by the late master Bob Ross. Over 8,000 paintings are in inventory, while several hundred are displayed at any one time in the museum's 12 galleries. The characteristic landscapes and seascapes, most of them painted live while being taped during the widely syndicated television show produced by Muncie Public Television, they are displayed chronologically to give the visitor a sense of Ross's progression of technique, <laughs> which culminate in the final umber phase predominant at the time of his untimely death. With a palette more extensive than every major artist save Delacroix, Mr. Ross's repetitive renderings of his special motif, a placid lake in an ancient fir forest, is made new with each painting. The artist's actual palettes are themselves displayed on the mezzanine, where the visitor can appreciate Bob Ross's meticulous craft in the mixing of paints, preserved in a kind of fossil record, which in its energy and elan rivals the most enthusiastic abstract expressionist works. Also of interest is the faithful recreation of the artist's studio in what was once woman's lingerie, where Mr. Ross's <laughs> easels, his primed and stretched canvases, his tubes of paint are arrayed in the manner they were found upon his passing. Here too are the myriad variety of brushes and palette knives, as well as his extensive collection of combs and hair picks, and a selection of his favorite, favorite models, such as a potted Norfolk Island pine, a bowler from the Jasper Beach in Maine, and a sky chart from the National Aeronautic and Space Administration showing the different categories of clouds. In the museum's entry vestibule, a bank of television monitors constantly features tapes of the master at work. Those tapes, along with poster, postcard, refrigerator, magnet reproductions of the work, may be purchased in the tastefully appointed gift shop where the visitor may also discover the complete library of Mr. Ross's instructional media. There is also the Happy Little Tree Cafe, which is <laughs> in Nouvelle Cuisine. <laughs> Kids, if you want to go into writing, where you want, if you want the dough, you go into textbook writing. And there's a guy over in Muncie named Joe Trimmer. Anybody know Joseph Trimmer? His textbook, lots of money. And so Joe, I read this over in Muncie, and Joe said, you know, I'm going to buy you one of those paintings. And he went out and he found one, 5,000 bucks for a Bob Ross. And so he bought it. Of course, Joe, he bought it. I mean, he has the dough. And so he bought it, but he didn't give it to me. <laughs> Instead, he gave it to the, to the uh, student center over in, uh, over in Muncie. And so you can actually see the Bob Ross that was meant for me over in that <laughs> All right, so now we're going to go to another book. Um, uh, Ohio and Virginia, I know. Did you want to sit down? Did you want to drink? Oh, no, no, you come, there's a seat. You don't have to um, You know, Ohio and, uh, and Virginia argue, you Ohio and the uh, yeah, you argue with Virginia about who has had the most presidents. Right? It's Ohio, right? Not Virginia. Uh, but there is no argument who has had the most vice presidents. Indiana. <laughs> Five of them. And you know them, and you love them, you've collected the cards when you were kids. <laughs> Great minds, all of them, including Schuyler Colfax and John Marshall, who gave us that great saying, first about the vice presidency, that it wasn't worth a bucket of warm spit, and uh, second, that what this country needs is a good five-cent cigar, really, intellects, and all the way up to uh, Dan Quayle, um, the most recent. And there were actually three who were on tickets, three Indiana uh, Hoosiers, 
who were on tickets and didn't get elected. And had uh, Hillary been nominated, probably, you know, Evan Bayh would have been another vice president. All from Indiana. It's great, you know, the second place state. It's, it's <laughs> and uh, 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 anyway, Dan Quayle was my representative in Congress. And many of you being Midwesterners, you know this when you publish your first book. The, what, what you have to do is send your representative in Congress a copy of your book. And so I did. I sent a, a, a little a book to Dan Quayle, and he wrote back, and he said, your heartwarming stories of Indiana make us all proud. Keep up the good work. And I framed that and put that you know, up on my name. And, uh, and so years later, well, when he was vice president, I was thinking, what should I do? You know, and I looked up at that thing, and, ah, he gave me permission. So I wrote a book, <laughs> and, uh, I wrote a book called Pensees, which is the Hooser pronunciation for pensée, Pensees, The Thoughts of Dan Quayle. Uh, so that translates as Thoughts, The Thoughts of Dan Quayle. Um, and, uh, uh, and again, you know, the kids, you probably don't remember the, the founder, or one of the leaders of, uh, of uh, China, the People's Republic of China, was a guy named Mao. And Mao had a little red book of his thoughts. And so we made this book look exactly like Mao's book. Except it was gray. So it's a little gray book of Dan Quayle's thoughts. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Um, uh, well, Dan, uh, you know, Dan went on to be vice president. After that, uh, he, his parents owned the Indianapolis Star. And when he began running for president, they did a kind of Citizen Kane on his own book his own memoir that he wrote, uh, and we brought out our book at the same time that that book came out. But they were doing the Citizen Kane, right? So they covered it as a news story, as a political story, as a, an art story, as a financial story. You know, Dan Quill's book out, Dan Quill's book out. And mine came out at the same time, and so my book was uh, a sidebar news story, which meant they went to Dan Quill and they said, uh, you know, what do you think of Michael Martone? And Dan Quill, you know, it's in the newspaper, says, Who's he? Uh, so I cut that out and framed. You know. <laughs> okay, so uh, there are 12 thoughts in the book. Uh, uh, and like Pascal, they're on various things. On uh, The Little Prince, on Barbie and Ken, on The Planet of the Apes, uh, on The State of the Union. Uh, and this one, how many of you know what snipe hunting is? How many of you don't know what snipe hunting is? Okay, pay attention to who does not know, and after this, we'll take you out snipe hunting. Okay, so this is on snipe hunting. And this, okay, you get the bit. This is Dan Quill thinking. <laughs> they told me to wait, so I wait. They gave me a burlap sack and pushed me out of the car into the ditch next to the field. I watched the taillights disappear. They told me they would drive the snipes my way. <laughs> Wait here. And I do. Stars are in the sky. I'm in a mint field. The branches of the low bushes brush against my legs, releasing the reeking smell. I think, suddenly, they are not coming back. Back home, they are waiting for me to figure out they are not coming back. They are thinking of this moment, the one happening now, when I think this thought, that they're not coming back. And then, they come, then I come home on my own. But, I think, I'll wait. While waiting, I'll think of them waiting for me to return home with the empty burlap sack. They'll think that I haven't thought yet that I was left here in the mint field, that I'm waiting for them to drive the snipes my way. I'll let them think that. In the morning, I will be here waiting. They will come back looking for me. Dew will have collected on the mint bushes. The stars will be there, but they'll be invisible. I won't have thought that thought yet, the one they wanted me to think. The imaginary quarry is still real and still being driven my way. Um, this is actually in Indiana. Dan Quayle actually is the only person, the only vice president to have a vice presidential library. It's in Huntington, Indiana. Anybody been there yet? I mean, I really, I'm not making this up. Go there. It is an amazing thing. And it, it, online, too, good online presence. Great gift store. You can get highball glasses and golf towels, you know, with Dan's face on it. <laughs> it's terrific. And so after the book came out, I went up there with a couple copies of the book, and I donated it to the library. They were a little, you know, leery about it. 
But I finally convinced them, you know, it's about Dan Quayle, you should have a, you should have this there. So they took them, and then I took them, you know, the price off my taxes, and everybody was happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we are at the end. How are you doing so far? I mean, you're okay? I mean, no, it's okay. Um, this is a little bit longer one. It's from the newest book that I just finished. Um, I've been really interested in uh, what the book is called Four for a Quarter. And I'm interested in things that are based on four. Um, the four winds, the four chambers of the heart, the four questions at Passover, the four seasons, the four corners, the four directions. Uh, there are four states that begin with I uh, here. Um, what else? Uh, the four in hand tie, uh, the uh, plus fours, four H club, the four F. Um, uh, I just finished one. In fact, I was really quite excited uh, to come here. Uh, four dead in Ohio. Um, uh, let's see. Um, well, uh, you get it, and you'll tell me some more. The Fab Four, the four-stroke engine, uh, yeah, plenty of fours. All of a sudden, I've, I've been obsessed by it, uh, uh, and it took, I started it when I was 44. Now we have the 44th president, and this, you know, the U.S. stamp is now 44 cents, so I figure it's time to end this all. But I also have my students, as their final, to, do, to go and find an old four-for-a-quarter, now they're four-for-three-dollar photo booth strip. You remember those? At, amusement parks in Woolworths when we had Woolworths. Uh, and what I love about it is that, and they have to tell a story in the, using, by means of the photo strip. So you can't go to those Polaroid ones where they take four pictures of the same. It has to be time sequential. And so what you usually do, right, you've done this, is like you go, and then, <laughs> and then the third one is like, what the hell? <laughs> and then the fourth one is, oh, better get a good one. <laughs> right? I mean, I love that, that do, do, uh, do, uh, as, as a kind of sequencing of narrative. Um, so a lot of the stories are about that, and it's uh, various fours and four per quarter. And uh, so what I'm going to do is read one that's based on a comic strip, or a comic book, uh, The Fantastic Four. Now, uh, some of you maybe don't know about comics, others are probably really into comics. Uh, do you know about the Fantastic Four, some of you? They made very bad movies of it recently. <laughs> um, the, if you're into comics, there's like two big universes, the Marvel Universe and the DC Universe. The, the Fantastic Four is in the Marvel Universe. I mean, for those guys out there, you know, keeping track, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. All you really know to, uh, need to know about the Fantastic Four, again, correct me if I'm wrong, is that four people were sent into outer space where they were cosmically irradiated. And they, what? Oh, five. Oh, it's true. Oh, it's true. Okay. Forget about Dr. Doom. Okay. There's four of them. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Uh, but the four of them that became the Fantastic Four were sent into outer space where they're cosmically irradiated, and they came back to Earth significantly changed. Okay? All right. And all right. so this is, again, from uh, Four for Four. And thank you so much for coming out tonight on, on a cold night. You're going, what cold is it? Nothing. Um, and this is called The Sex Life of the Fantastic Four. <laughs> Invisible Girl. Where he touches me, I vanish. The back of his hand stroking my face erases my cheek. Involuntary, the skin initially, then the deeper flesh. I, uh, the skin first gone where it feels his fingertips. I feel the surface disappear, but still feel feeling there. His touch sinks in, the subdermal layers go, the nested cells he polishes clear, his soft palm hovering. By the time I've stripped off the blue bodysuit, stepping out of the spandex which retains for a second the shape of my body as it falls, the body it reveals has already become translucent, the meat turning milky, the bone white clear in streaks like the smear of butter melts the white from a paper plate. I become clarified grease beneath him, entwined. We are tangled up in the skein of my airy sinews, the ropey braids of my circulatory system, its cartoon of primary reds and blues. My blood thins in the extremities but knots at the nodes of erectile tissue, clotting a nipple visible again beneath the sheen he is left from licking what looked a moment before like air. Now, me, there, concentrated into rubbery, ruby light again. It disappears into his mouth. I'm down to the broken dashes of the central nervous system, suggesting, still outlining the outer neural net of my skin, 
feeding me the synaptic codes of dots and dits from the dissipating periphery. His hands, as they caress nothing, reveal me to myself, leave the after image of his movement burned upon the transparent wall of my retina, the lightning streak of his skin shaping the borders of my own body. I close my eyes and watch as my eyelids dissolve. My vision passes through skin first, uh, turning the, then to scrim, to see now through another unoccluded lens. I see through my lids, through myself, see his cock clearly moving inside of the vast and now empty, empty space that must be me and must be not me. The Human Torch. I sit at the bar usually, drinking ouzo, neat, a Jordan almond dissolving in the bottom of the shot glass. I've set the liqueur on fire, swizzling it with my finger. I like to watch the floor show and the show on the floor, the tunnel crowd weirded out by the drag queens doing strip teases and singing old torch songs, one more for my baby, one more for the road, setting up Lady Day or Barbara, that kind of thing. I dump some water into my aperitif, extinguishing the blue flame and turning the drink chalky like a precipitate in a test tube. My current favorite is Eliza Interpreter, who vamps this obscure number, is it by Mercer? Which plays with the line, you've let yourself go. She sings to her lug of a lover how he's gotten fat and dull, how their liaison has suffered the consequences. There follows a litany of complaint. What a schlub, she sings, you've let yourself go. But it turns in the end, it always turns. Come on over here, she whispers. Come on over and let yourself go. I tear up, naturally. But it isn't saline staining my cheek. It's a dab of molten lava percolating there in the corner of my eye, my own brand of running mascara. I have to watch myself. Spontaneously, my eyelashes can ignite, throwing sparks up into the tinder of my eyebrow, which can smolder for hours without my knowing it. Once, I set the sprinklers off in the Russian bathhouse on 10th. Bath, bath I've stopped looking for a boy who can top me. It's too dangerous. The leather bar is too hot. I was cooking inside the horsehide Eisenhower jacket, cooking the jacket, the seared meat flesh, an additional turn on, I suppose. These powers we've acquired seem to fall into the dark space between the involuntary responses wired into us and those we can modulate. Not like the heartbeat on the one hand, or walking home in the other, but the, like blinking or winking, say, or like desire itself. There is only so much one can do to help oneself. Oh, sure, I can bellow, flame on, all I want, turning solid, blush of bluff, solid buff flesh to superheated gaseous vapor, the controlled burn, here the scalding, here the precise scalding, there the delicate sweating of copper pipes. But it is in my weaker moments when I'm weak in the knees, a stranger's hand on my hand will steam off skin. I can't watch myself all the time. A human touch sets off the human torch. I am a captive within my own sublime hide. Mr. Fantastic. To make the edge of the famous samurai swords of antiquity, the smiths, of the, uh, the smiths beat the iron flat into foil, then they folded the metal over and hammered it flat again. And then another fold and peening, and still another, and then another, thousands of times, fold and flatten, fold and flatten, until in this primitive way, through brute force and patience, the metal's crystalline structure becomes saturated with itself. Atoms are packed inside the spaces between atoms, at last, both the surface and simultaneously its underside, now no more than a molecule deep, the edge of the matrix, serrated only by the minute undulation of subatomic matter, a sine wave spanning a mere handful of angstroms of the uttermost electron shell. Sharp, you bet. It is what I find myself doing to my own skin in private moments. I stretch and fold and knead it back together, a wrinkle in the loose hide of my forearm, a flap of fat at my chin. It is the very definition of definition, and I spend hours honing my musculature, ironing in the pleats on my belly, increasing the cant of my cheekbone with the finest shade of a sharpened pencil line. I know what people are thinking. 
the elasticity of your normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill, uncosmically irradiated penis is itself a goddamn miracle to most. The way it inflates, its skin thinning to the gauziest of tissues, webbed by a diaphanous capillary sponge grown thick with the stiffened rebar of packed and interlocking corpuscles. Sure, I've tried it all. I've swallowed myself whole. I took myself and myself from behind. For a while, for a while she liked to watch it snake toward her across the floor, like the way it coiled up the leg, then threaded the cleft of her rear, whipping around her waist, then back up her back, curling over her shoulder and back down between her breasts, down to her stomach, parting her down, down there, and then into her labia and into her from above, how its tensile strength lifted her in a hardened harness, held her weightless as it expanded within her and all around her. We don't do that much anymore. <laughs> and believe me, everything, everything grows familiar. Recently, our lovemaking has tended toward the less Baroque. A simple vertical embrace, my member remembering its scale before the accident. Sue, her legs wrapped around my waist, is saddled on my hips, writing this altogether unfantastic appendage, and me supporting her, strapping my silly pliant arms around her, and then around me, and then around her again, stretching another lap and lapping another lap, another band around us both, belting us to us, my arms still encircling and casing us from head to toe, the cocoon spinning while we kiss, uh, my elasticity nearing its end, a face to the point of transparency, my thinning skin becoming at last the clear outer covering at last of this new creature we create. And finally, the thing. I don't really need the briefs down below since my thing ain't there no more. It's more for show to let the folks know I was once a guy. A scrap of cloth for the modesty's sake, the citizens craning their necks to take a gander at me. They can't get past the orangey crust of skin. It's something, all right. Little do they know I'm hanging out there for anybody to see my Johnson or what I take to be my Johnson. Johnson's really, I don't know, since there's no other thing like me, as far as I can tell, to let me try out these doohickeys of wadded calluses and thingamabobs of oozing mucus. Is plopped there right in front of their collective noses. Just more eruptions and rashes on the sliding plates of my scaly surface. The doc explained it to me, showed me the tinker toy models of your typical twisted normal gene, and then how mine's been tripled another worm squirming around the ladder of goofy golf balls. It's simple for everybody but me, male and female, male and female down to everybody's bones but me. No bones for me, no in and out, no on and off, a whole other dimension of nookie. What I have become needs a couple other things to reproduce, I guess, not just one other. Sex, as near as I can figure, is like nothing you can dream of since those dirty pictures in your brains pumping out are made up of, you got it, those same twin strands caught wrapped up in one another. Well, I am another other, and I'm on the lookout for other others like me. Meantime, when I'm alone, but this could be in the middle of Times freaking square, a public spectacle where the public can't begin to see the me that's me. I make myself have this nameless thing. I feel this thing thing. I have no words, no more for. Thank you very much. No questions? Anything? Is it going down Euclid? What, 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 you, you, yeah. Going down Euclid? In, in, Throw the hammer down. Throw the hammer down. And, uh, <laughs> what, nothing. Yeah. What prompted you to write the, uh, the uh, story in collaborative or contributor notes? Just writing that whole book at one time. Uh, it actually, I wrote the blue guide first, and uh, you know, are you a writer? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. But you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm so. Right, you, but I mean, the jury's still out. And well, no, no. You, I mean, you, if you're right, you're a writer, and if you send th send things out and, and and you get it accepted, I mean, you have this weird sort of interaction with the editor, and editors sort of routinely, you know, they just say, 
send a contributor's note, and everybody already agrees what that is. And, and just when I finished that book and the editor said, you know, send a bio note, I thought, whoa, you know, I really haven't thought what that is. And, um, and I had for a long time in mind uh, the weird fact that um, if you watch MASH, the television show, Dr. Burns is from Fort Wayne, Indiana. And he would have been a doctor in Fort Wayne about the time that I was born. So I imagine that I was born in Fort Wayne and Dr. Frank Burns from MASH was the attending physician. <laughs> um, so I thought I just would, that would be my bio at yeah, this time. And so I sent it in and, and they published it as that, you know? Uh, and so I thought, well, this is interesting. Uh, what, what else about my life, uh, you know, is there? And so I, yeah, as I continued, I just kept writing more bio notes. And finally, that sort of, you know, took over my interest. Uh, and I still write bio notes. I, I sort of can't stop writing those kinds of contributors. I didn't find it great because sometimes the bio notes are better than the pieces in the journal. Well, I know, and I, we were talking in, in the class that I'm doing here, uh, you know, we all, as writers, you know, you, you, we were, we're sort of shy about it, but you say, do you want to be published? And they say, yeah. And so you, you begin asking why you want to be published, and you go, well, you know, I want to show up in a magazine. But I say, when you read those magazines, I say, what's the first thing you read? You go to the contributor's notes, you know? And you, I don't want to read that crap. I want to find out about these people. And, and so, you know, this is where the action is taking place, I think. You know, back in the back of the thing. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so it, it's interesting. Yeah? In my class, we read your piece for each. Uh -huh. Oh, you did? Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, it's such a wonderful hybrid of poetry and fiction. Oh, and some of my students felt a little bit resistant or uncomfortable at that, that idea. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. How do you, how do you talk about that? And what's the pleasure? And for you, and, and um, yeah. are we compelled to make a choice? Or? Well, I mean, it is interesting, isn't it? Um, we've been talking a lot this week uh, um, with, the, with the program here, and my students, I think, and something I've been thinking a lot about, which is it's a weird thing, if we think about it, for writers, creative writers, to be in a university, which is uh, resolutely a sort of critical place. And you know, by by definition, it wants to have departments, colleges, hierarchies of all kinds, and and it really trains and trains very well both scientists and humanists to think critically and split up things into categories, genres, as as ways of thinking. And I think humanly, we do have to think that way. But I also think there is the job of the writer or the job of the artist to actually be. I mean, my favorite god is Hermes. Uh, you know, uh, the, it, it is about, it is about, I think it's our job as, as writers and artists to be in between things and to actually move and nudge and define where those borders are. And I think it's another other job. You know, you know about Hermes? You, you got to love the Greeks. Yeah, they're amazing. Okay, you know what Hermes did first when he was a baby? The first thing he did, he stole his brother Apollo's cattle. He's a baby. He's a toddler. He steals the cattle. And he makes the cattle actually walk backwards in their track. You know, so the, Apollo's going, who stole my cattle? It was the baby. And he goes and looks at Hermes, and Hermes goes, who the baby? So Hermes, I mean, you know, Hermes, I mean, this is you know, art and, and science and brilliance. And, and Hermes is, you know, and finally he figures it out. And, you know, Hermes says, okay, I stole your cattle. You can have this cat. And he says, he says, you know, to make you feel better, what Hermes does is make something that we associate with Apollo or with music, and that is, uh, or with art, and that is, he gave Apollo, Apollo Apollo's lyre, you know? Okay, so Apollo can make music. He's an artist, but he didn't make the lyre. The baby made the lyre to appease Apollo. And, uh, you know, and so the baby actually, you know, actually in some ways, you know, makes the art. I mean, that, that's, that's the job. The job of the artist is to make the art, not to figure out what to do with it. That's the job of the critic. That's far-thinking Apollo, you know? And, and, and there is, you know, a, a Hermes also is, you know, the patron of bankers, the patron of thieves. You can be it can be found at the crossroads. Um, and this is where I think if we think of ourselves as artists, that's where we are. 
we are about mediating between all these things and mixing them up. And in so mixing up the categories, what you do is actually, you know, creative writing, creative work is not like God's creativity. You're not making up something out of nothing. Instead, you're taking the things that we're bored with and rearranging them. So a great creative act was when they came up with the cliché, it's raining cats and dogs. We know what cats and dogs are, we know what rain is. Some Hermes artists put those two things together and transformed the world. And we never saw rain or cats and dogs in the same way again. And so to say, I mean, that's a stitch. So we got into the university, this is going on way too long, but you got into the university and of course the university says, okay, we have prose writers, we have poets. We have critics, okay, all like that, and, and here we have to hire. Yes, we have to identify that we are hiring a pro. And, and all the time, you just want to go, mm -hmm. you know, just, mm -hmm. I mean, if, especially when you're inside that beast that wants to hold those categories stable, when what your real job is is to erode those categories, rearrange them, uh, make you see in a, in a different way. Um, do you know about the Museum of Jurassic Technology? Do you know? Anybody, anybody know? Anybody have been to the Museum of Jurassic Technology? Oh my God, you've got to go online to the Museum of Jurassic Technology. It, it, it's a fake natural history museum. Okay, and it's run by a guy named David, David Wilson. And you go in there and you see, we were talking about this, right? I saw it with somebody. Oh yeah, it, it, at the, up, up at Kent we were talking about this. You go in there and you have this, you, you, the one display is an ant, a South American ant, that inhales a spore, and the spore goes into the head, and uh, it creates this weird sort of thing, and makes the ant go crazy, and it grows antlers. <laughs> and then it climbs up a tree to a certain height, and bites into it with its big mandibles, and its head explodes, and rains spores down on the floor of the forest where other ants inhale it. And so it's this huge display explaining this ant. And so Lawrence Welsher, who wrote the book about this, you know, is going there, and going, okay. And then he goes next door, and there's a huge block of lead. And the lead block has been cut away, and in it is a bat, you know, a flying mammal. And it's caught sort of mid-flight. And the enabling apparatus around it says, there's a certain species of bat in the world that has so developed its echolocation possibilities that it can fly through solid objects. <laughs> and this one got caught. This one didn't make it through this block of lead. And, uh, so Welcher, the, the guy, goes to David Wilson, the, the curator of this, of this museum, and he says, come on. He says, this isn't, and Wilson is so great, he says, would you like more information? <laughs> and so he keeps giving him more pamphlets and papers on these, on the, on these species. And, and, and he never breaks, he never breaks. And he says, well, you know, he says, this can't be real. You, things cannot fly through walls. And he says, well, you know, I don't know. I've never seen it, but I do have evidence of it. I mean, look at these papers here. And, you know, and he, look at the guy caught in the block of lead there. That, you know, that says something. And uh, so Welsher takes this material to the bat guy at Cornell. Uh, and, uh, and he says, what's going on? And the, and the guy says, this is really good. He says, he says, the citations are real, the scientists that he's quoting here, there is a tradition of folklore in sub-Saharan Africa of bats that can fly through grass walls. He says, of course it's not true. And he says, but, and this is the, this is the, that's the long uptake to this answer for your students. He said, but, he said, when we originally, these are scientists now, not, not creative writers, when we originally came up with the idea that a flying mammal has a biological radar that allows it to echolocate and find prey and its way around at night. No one believed us either. And then and then Welcher said, well, what about the ant? He says, that's true. <laughs> there is a species of ant in that spore thing that happens in South America. So that, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, what, what that is or what the job of the writer is, is to actually bring up the very questions that your students brought up. Like, what the hell is, this? I mean, you know, I thought my world was a stable thing, but no, I mean, that's just all a kind of agreed upon conventions, and you're just making clear these things uh, in a kind of uncomfortable way, you know, making clear that the world has other possibilities before we all settle down into the way things are, right? I mean, don't you, don't you think that's? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
you got to go to the Museum of Jurassic. Well, another thing you do, you go in there and you don't know it, but you trip a, a, a little thing and the lights begin to go down very slowly. So the longer you're going around in the museum, it's a storefront museum on Santa Monica Boulevard, or uh, Venice Boulevard in Los Angeles. Uh, the longer you're in there, the darker it gets. But you never, you never, you can't tell. You know, and then all of a sudden, you realize you're in complete darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, somebody? Yeah. Um, uh, this might have to do with what you were talking about, but I, I noticed in the pieces that you read tonight, a lot of all the characters, and I think they're being facetious when you when you say yeah, work, you didn't like characters. Yeah. But they were all reappropriated. I mean, even yourself. You had, you had Bob Ross. Yeah. You had Fantastic Four. You had Dan Quayle, and you had yeah. yourself. Very good. Is That's there, very good. Is there is there a way? Is, what do you get from reappropriating characters as opposed? To, what difference? Do you well, again, I mean, that's, that's uh, to admit my weakness. I just don't, uh, I can't do, I can't make them up. Might as well take them off the shelf, you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's re they're ready to wear. Uh, um, so, um, I mean, that's what, I, part of what I get. And also part of what I get is, and of course I'm reading this, I mean, one of the, the things that I find interesting is, because I'm really interested in myth, too, and how myth is different. Myth is a sort of shared and community story. And what the Greeks did with myth, of course, is, you know, there was a general story that the whole community sort of holds, and then you find a little bit of it that you know, maybe will emphasize or re rewrite or whatever. Um, and I think that's really interesting um, to do it that way. So what are contemporary myths? Um, so my first book, or one of my first books, is uh, Fort Wayne is Seventh on Hitler's List. Which is the belief that Fort Wayne, if Hitler had gotten over here in World War II, it was important enough to be destroyed. Um, which is a very Midwestern thing, right? We weren't number two or number three, but seven, man. Uh, you know, and, and we were really that important. We make copper wire. Um, and, and no one has any evidence of that. And yet growing up, the generation older than me constantly was telling me this in a kind of prideful way. You know, if Hitler had gotten over here, we'd be... We didn't toast. Uh, and, but, it, but it is, it, you know, I mean, it's this, that we're, anyway, that was like a myth. And it turned out, uh, my mom was a freshman English teacher, as I said in my fiction. Um, and, uh, and she taught every year mythology. Edith Hamilton, you read it, Edith Hamilton? You got that little mentor paperback with Perseus on the cover? Mm -hmm. Flip that baby over. There's a picture of Edith looking like a very school marm that she was. It says, Edith Hamilton grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And it turns out that I, I played in Hamilton Park, which was her family's land. And here was the great, the great uh, initiator of Greek myths in America was from my hometown. And she was basically talking about a culture that was pretty much no larger than Fort Wayne, Indiana, that had all these stories that survived all these years. And I thought, well, you know, Athens in the Golden Age took its stories seriously. So what are the stories that are serious to me? And so that's, that's why I, I never was interested in, again, creating new characters, but characters that were already there and seeing the sort of nuance and, and playfulness. And, and not only that, like in the Dan Quayle book, chances are, if you know Dan Quayle at all, and I know he's drifting into history now, probably you would think, the first thing you would think is potato. <laughs> So as a writer, I never had to mention the word potato. You were already thinking that. As a writer, I have to know, or I have to sort of say, well, how can I play with the, I mean, the absence of potato that you already are there? What other stuff can I plant in your head, you know, to play in this mythological storytelling, as opposed to a, a sort of standalone storytelling? Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. mythologies are, I don't know, I'm, I'm just interested in and, and really, too, I have a rough time. I have a rough time with um, when we talk about character. What we're really meaning, you know, well, I told this to the class, you know, one of the greatest fiction writers of the 19th and 20th century uh, in the world was Sigmund Freud, and he invented a character called the unconscious. And now when we think of character, we do think in terms of that deep, realistic, you know, psychologically realistic character that's ba based on another mythology, a mythology that guy in Vienna made up. Um, you know, there's no evidence of it. Psychiatry doesn't take it seriously anymore. But we, it still has potency for us. 
but for me, that was, you know, I mean, everybody was playing that game, and I was sort of less interested in that kind of character. But when we say character, I think that's what we mean. We mean a, well, a character with psychological depth, where, you know, childhood trauma or childhood experience somehow uh, goes inside of us, gets buried, and then reemerges in, in another traumatic experience later, those kinds of things. Um, but I, you know, I thought, oh, I can do it. I can do pre-Freudian character, which is essentially what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm just kind of curious what Marvel takes of your take on the fantastic four. I'm worried. Um, <laughs> my, uh, in Blue Guy, uh, I, I'm now. Uh, have you ever gotten a cease and desist order? Fortunately, no. Uh, it's fine. Um, when I did, when I did, I mean, here's the downside of using real people. Um, so the first thing I did was invade privacy, and the lawyer said, you have to do this. And, and it was a story that was about James Dean, but it was told in the voice of uh, his high school English teacher, a woman named Mrs. Nall, who was alive at the time. You give up privacy if you're famous and if you're, if you're dead. <laughs> and so the lawyer said, and it was a monologue where she just, I mean, it wasn't libelous. It was just her talking about her student, James Dean. And the lawyer said, can you substantiate, and even though I labeled it fiction, you know that little inoculation phrase, this is a work of fiction, any relation, it doesn't work. Uh, even if it's fiction, if you change the name, you know, if Mrs. Now wanted to come after me, or think of, you know, you're writing about your mother, but you call it somebody else, you change the color of her hair. If your mother's pissed off enough at you, she can come after you for privacy invasion. Really weird. So I got a cease and desist order for that. Um, and I had to get her permission to publish the story. Um, and so I went to a bar in Marion, Indiana. I read her the story, and she said, well, it's all lies. And I said, yeah, I know. And she said, but I understand what you're doing. So I've got her permission on a cocktail napkin. Um, frame. Yeah, it's frame. <laughs> and, uh, but they were so, up, and, it, and it's a court sort of problem. It's not statute. So every court case decides, and it goes back and forth, because the other right is right of expression. And um, um, so, um, uh, so you know, the courts, you, you really got to invade privacy to do that. But I couldn't publish a story in the voice of Mark Spitz because at the time they thought that he was no longer a public figure but, but more a private citizen. And do, do you know who Mark Spitz is? Some of you do, some of you don't. Um, anyway, uh, so that was my first. In Blue Guide, to Indiana, or Blue Guide to Indiana, I made it look exactly like the actual Blue Guides, Blue Guide to Greece, Blue Guide to England, and uh, they came after me for trademark violation, uh, cease and desist. What we had to do was take an ad out in Publishers Weekly and say this is not a real Blue Guide. And uh, I also, there's also a, a sticker on the cover that says this is not a real guide, you know, do not be, and it's interesting uh, that we went to the lawyer and said, you know, we could beat this in court, but... Uh, you know, it would break the press, and the guy said, yeah, I know, but we have to come after you. Um, this is the matter of trademark law. Um, because if they didn't come after me, even though they knew it was a parody or a satire, and somebody did bring out a blue guy that was a real copy, and they didn't, and then they went after him, they'd say, well, you didn't go after me, you didn't go after the Michael Martone book. So they have to go after everybody. And the great, great thing of that is that McDonald's, when it went into Scotland, the first thing McDonald's did, the hamburger chain, was sue every restaurant that had McDonald's in the name mm -hmm. to protect their trademark. And uh, now with with the Fantastic Four, copyright violation. So I'm going to hit the trifecta. <laughs> and now that the Fantastic Four and Marvel is owned by Disney, oh my God. <laughs> so that's one reason I like to read this, because I really don't think I'll be able to publish it in the book. I think they'll come after me. And my only hope is I, I publish in really little obscure things and they won't see it. But, <laughs> but if they do, they will. Especially this. They'll. 